Hello. We're here to show you step by step how to replace a compressor. Watch the video and enjoy the training. Hey, Fred, everything okay? Yes, Joe, how are you? What problem do we need to resolve today in this cooling system? Um, well, I don't know yet. This piece of equipment is in a bar and is not turning on. So what am I doing? I'm reading the compressor's data sheet that I downloaded from Embraco's website to clarify some technical data, okay? That's right, very good. So in the meanwhile, I'll get the Phillips and flathead screwdrivers, pliers, and a multimeter to do the initial check. Uh, well, uh, Fred, since you have more experience and are always keeping yourself up to date, could you show me how to do a complete check as well, please? Sure, let's go. Well, the first step, Joe, is to disconnect the power cable and remove the cover of the electrical components. Then remove the relay. It's also necessary to remove the start capacitor and overload protector. Then we have to check for electrical continuity in the power cable. Okay, it has continuity, right? Yes. So now you have to test the electrical continuity in the overload protector and the capacitance of the start cap. In the relay, you first have to check the primary coil in this way. If it has electrical continuity, then it's okay. Afterwards, we check the auxiliary winding. In this case, we have to first check it in the correct position and it must indicate no electrical continuity. Next, we turn it upside down and then it should indicate continuity. The relay's okay. Oh, right. So now we need to check the compressor's windings through the three terminal contacts, testing two at a time. Here it's all okay. Oops, here it shows that it's open. Then the compressor is burned out. Okay, so let's replace it. Okay, I'll release the refrigerant. Uh, hand me the perforating valve and that manifold over there. And you can use any manifold? Uh, no, Joe, you must use the appropriate manifold for each type of refrigerant. We do this to avoid any contamination by different types of oils, and we also need to be careful with the various pressures. How do you release the refrigerant properly? You just have to install a perforating valve in the process tube and open the valve to release the gas. Remember, R290 or propane is a flammable gas, and we need to be sure it is not allowed to accumulate too much in one spot. Be sure to have adequate ventilation. So, uh, can I release any kind of refrigerant into the atmosphere this way? No, it's not like that, Joe. This compressor uses R290, which is an ecological gas and can be released into the atmosphere, as well as the R600A used in household refrigerators. For any other type of refrigerant, it's mandatory to use a recovery machine and approved reclaim cylinder to collect the refrigerant, since most gases cause damage to the ozone layer and increase the greenhouse effect. You understand? Ah, got it. I understand. So after releasing the refrigerant, we'll connect the nitrogen cylinder on the manifold and inject the gas at a pressure of 50 PSI. But why inject nitrogen? Because it's necessary in compressors with flammable refrigerants, such as R600A and R290, to avoid buildup in the condenser and the evaporator. It's an extra safeguard, Joe. Well, now that the nitrogen has been released, just remove the valve. Do you have to sand the original tubes of the refrigerator? Yes, you do. To facilitate brazing, they should be sanded in areas where there is solder in the area closest to the compressor. After sanding, cut the discharge and suction tubes, leaving 20 to 30 millimeters from the end of the process tube. I heard that it's not recommended to unsolder the tubes because some clogging can occur and some of the flammable gas may be retained in the system and cause some kind of problem. Is this true, Fred? Yes, that's true, Joe. So you have to be very careful with this. Well, now that we've cut the tubes, 
The compressor can be removed. Grab the oxyacetylene torch so that we can remove the filter. But can't we use the same filter? No, it's not possible because the desiccant material can absorb moisture only once, then it's saturated. Ah, okay. That's right. Neutral flame, neither oxidizing nor carburizing. Uh, the capillary tube got clogged. And now what? Uh, no problem, Joe. Just cut about 20 to 30 millimeters from the tip of the tube with a file. And now we'll clean the circuit to remove residues and inject the nitrogen. But do you have to clean the tubes every time you change the compressor? No, only when the compressor motor is burned out or when the system has excess moisture or contaminants. Then you need a cleaning solvent and not only the nitrogen charge. Okay. You see how easy it is? First step, weld the tube connector to the suction line of the system. Second step, charge a cylinder with about 500 milliliters of solvent. Third step, couple the cylinder with solvent in the suction line connector. Fourth step, couple the N2 cylinder to the solvent cylinder with the help of the manifold and put the tip of the capillary into a container to receive the used solvent. Step five, release N2 at approximately 50 PSI and open the valve of the cylinder that contains the solvent. Step six, wait for the passage of the solvent through the tubing until only N2 leaves from the capillary's end. Do I still need the nitrogen? Yes, you do. After cleaning, it needs a nitrogen charge to eliminate any residual solvent. Also, repeat this whole process for the condenser. Great, now we can install the new filter. Can any filter be used? No, you need to install the right filter for each type of refrigerant. We need a filter with desiccant. We'll use one with three connections. Let's go. On the extra connection, we install a Schrader valve. It's very important to take away the cap before welding. Then we connect the filter on the condenser's outlet. Now you can bend the capillary tube about 15 millimeters from the tip and braze it into the other end of the filter. Done. I'll compare the label on the old compressor against the new compressor to check the gas type. You also have to check the equivalent capacity and compatibility of connections. It's important to remember that new compressors have new electricals. Now you have to check the tube diameters and positions of the tubes. Connect the discharge and suction tubes and install the Schrader valve on the process tube, removing the cap and valve before brazing. I'll do the welding the same way as before. That's it, Joe. Hey, Fred, uh, can I install the Schrader valve cap? Yeah, you can. And you can install the manifold to the process tube and on the filter's third connection. Now we'll inject a nitrogen charge of 100 PSI to check if there are any leaks in the welds by doing the leak test and passing the sniffer around the welds. And if I don't have a sniffer, how can I do it? Then it's also easy, Joe. All you have to do is pass some soap bubbles with a brush around the welds. Just don't forget to clean up afterwards. Okay, there are no leaks. 
I'll release the nitrogen. Done. Okay. And now I'm going to do the vacuum process. With another compressor? No, come on, you've got to stay more alert, Joe. The best way is to use a vacuum pump that reaches 500 microns or less, with a minimum capacity of 3 CFM. The best way is to carry out the vacuum process through both the low pressure side of the system connected to the process tube, as well as the high pressure side of the system connected to the service valve of the filter dryer. Oh, right, I understand. And how long should it stay in a vacuum? When the vacuum process reaches 500 microns, hold it for 20 minutes. What's the proper sequence to install the electrical components? First, you have to install the capacitor on the relay. Then the overload protector and the relay on the compressor's terminal. Afterwards, we connect the electrical wiring of the cooling system on the relay and the overload protector terminals. Once that's done, just put the cover of the electrical components back on. Now we must charge the gas by weight according to the product label, using a precision scale accurate to one gram in charging cylinder. We apply vacuum in the cylinder and weigh it to make sure it's zeroed out. We apply the required amount of correct refrigerant in the charging cylinder and inject the content through the manifold. Right, and you have to turn on the compressor again? Yes, to complete the charge, but only after equalizing. Do not forget to close the high pressure valve. Okay, I finished the charge. We close the valve of the charging cylinder, and next the valve of the manifold. We then weigh the cylinder to verify that all refrigerant has been applied. Okay, the cylinder is zeroed out. Great. To finish the installation, we'll remove the manifold and install the service valve caps. Okay. Now I'll sand and paint the weld points and give the system a final inspection. Perfect. When you finish, turn on the product for one to two hours to verify its performance. And what do we do with the old compressor? We just seal the tubes, Joe. The service is done. Wow. Thanks, Fred. You know everything. It's because I always try to keep myself updated. And so will I from now on.